Hi everyone and welcome to week 10's lecture on representation and the stage photograph. So today we're following on from last week's lecture looking at the body um, and the gaze specifically um, in terms of the male gaze um, and how that affects things as well as um, we looked at different theorist ideas regarding gender identity, um, the abject, different things regarding that. And I um, mentioned that we will look this week more on race and how the gaze plays into that and um, that idea. So starting off, I'm going back to a Susan Sontag quote that I shared with you earlier in the trimester. So Susan Sontag says here, although there is a sense in which the camera does indeed capture reality, not just interpret it, photographs are as much an interpretation of the world as paintings and drawings are. Um, I do love to reference Susan Sontag, don't I? Um, but I want you to think about what she's saying here. Because um, this idea is quite relevant at the time. We're going back to the beginnings of photography because I like doing that also. Um, and this photograph is by Hippolyte Bayard, um, who was a French photographer and pioneer in the history of photography. He invented his own processes, um, which he claimed to do before um, Der um, Daguerre or um, Henry Fox Talbot. Um, and there's sort of a bit of a backstory behind this. But Louis Digger was able to announce his process first and um, Bayard lost that recognition to be one of the principal inventors of photography. So um, he felt he had received great injustice and he created this staged photograph in response to it entitled Self-Portrait as a Drowned Man. And in the image, he's pretending to have committed suicide, sitting leaning to the right. Um, so is this the first fake photograph, fake news photograph created? You know, is it the first photograph as a joke? Is it the first propaganda protest photo? Um, you know, like most likely, quite possibly, it's the sort of the evidence we have of that, especially with him um, creating this process very early and being one of these um, people who was sort of experimenting and making these processes. So here we have, um, you know, what could be the first stage photograph of a person. And you know, he, he is, has himself as a dry man and he has a lot of symbology in this photograph as well, um, connoting this and setting up these details. So here is an image, very early stage photograph of, of that. And then we have um, Julia Margaret Cameron, who is a very important photographer and portraitist from the 19th century, British photographer, who actually took up the practice later in life at the age of 48. Uh, um, and she produced a large body of work, creating these tableaus, allegorical images, sort of... Um, inspired by 15th century paintings, um, mythology stories, history, you know, here you have parting of Sir Lancelot and Queen Guinevere. Um, and she made over 900 photographs over a 12 year period, but was very well known for creating these, these staged, um, very evocative, emotional portraits with photographs. So another John Berger quote, <laughs> um, but this is from his book, Understanding a Photograph. He says, a photograph is not necessarily a lie, but it isn't the truth either. It is, it's more like a fleeting subjective impression. And we're very much seeing that in these, these photographs um, here, this idea of photography being something you can create in stage and what control the photographer has in that. So if we go back to Julia Margaret Cameron, this is where we're getting more into today's 
this lecture's topic. So um, at the age of six, six, 60, she moved to Ceylon, Sri Lanka. Now Sri Lanka, but British power at the time taking over there. Um, and there are a lot of coffee plantations and tea plantations um, there at the time, run by, uh, you know, sort of taken over by the English, you know, colonial times and periods there. Um, so while she was there, she actually photographed um, portraits of maid servants and plantation workers. But the very interesting thing is, um, as you can see in this image, which is posed, um, is that she posed them in really unnatural outdoors or sort of clothed them, clothed them in ways to emphasise their exoticism, the exotic factor, sort of um, to highlight this difference and to kind of create this sort of mythical impression of them, but also in the same sense that she was doing before, but now representing it as some kind of truth or not is, is the thing. Um, and again, the thing is, um, all her models, you know, which would have been workers and people who are sort of not really in a place of power, are also nameless. Um, as you can see here, um, you know, in this one, only the woman who is staged to paint is, um, is named. So they're more ethnographic than of artistic interests in terms of what critics discuss about them. But you can see she's staging and dressing them and posing them to depict something particular. So Susan Sontag um, writes about how, you know, when you have this camera, the power you have, but she also compares the photograph to a gun and the fact that, you know, she says here, there is something predatory in the act of taking a picture. To photograph people is to violate them by seeing them as they can, um, as they never see themselves. By having knowledge of them, they can never have. It turns people into objects that can be symbolically possessed. And this is coming back to that idea again, which we talked about early in the trimester, of um, the photograph being an object, but also the subject um, being an object. And that was the same thing in this last week's lecture on the gaze. So this idea of the object again. And um, by capturing these photographs, what, what what are we doing and what is our role and do we need to really think about our role as a photographer? Um, creating these depictions of people and how are we representing them? Do we have a right to represent them? So at this time in the 19th century, you know, with the advent of photography, um, you can see these constructed depictions of this idea of the exotic and the other and the different. Um, what we see here is, you know, two men in what we assume is their dress um, against the backdrop. So it's a, it's a staged environment. It's a studio. Um, they could be given this dress. They could be posed. They're not given names. Here, um, you know, we see this again. Um, and J.W. Lynn is a very famous Australian photographer. And, you know, you can see this is opposed once again with the backdrop. The Aboriginal man is unnamed and he's leaning in the subservient way against the Bushman, on the Bushman's leg against the ground, um, you know, and uh, these are things that we should look at when we create photographs, but also when we look at archives of images and how people were represented and why they were represented that way and understand the history and what was happening at the time and how that racism existed. So there is a lot of writing to come up about this colonial gaze. In this case, Ian Kaplan terms it the imperial gaze. So she says here that the imperial gaze reflects the assumption that the white Western subject is central much as the male gaze assumes the centrality of the male subject. So we talked about the male gaze, but here it's this imperial gaze, it's this colonial gaze, it's this gaze of sort of um, the white Western subject having power 
um, over viewing the other, the exotic or, you know, the different. So what we want to think about is how does it, how does this get shifted? Um, and another key theory is who writes about representations of the other by the West. He, so there's this terminology, um, there's the Occident and the Orient. So the Orient is this creation by the West, by, you know, looking, looking at, at them and sort of um, seeing them as different and othering them um, and creating stereotypes of what they are. So creating stereotypes here of what uh, Muslim people are or Middle Eastern people are. And quite often these stereotypes are negative, you know, either overtly sexual or baddies who, you know, people who always play the bad guys in movies. And these days, um, more so known as terrorists in every, you know, in every, um, you know, movie we watch or representation. So, um, in Edward Said's Orientalism, he talks about this, um, and you can see that a lot in Orientalist painting. It's a sort of exotic, um, fetishization, very sexual and overt. So here, you know, um, talking about harems and the way these, you know, um, these women are and um, how so you can see here it says Tangier, Morocco, a harem um, and quite often you know in these orientalist paintings they would paint white women posing as um, as these overtly sexual women so you know in these are these hand colored postcards which were which were becoming common around this time that would be sort of sent around there to represent this and to sort of show these exciting different different people in different places. And as you can see here, this was another stage photograph. You know, here's a, um, a Filipino boy, you know, natural. And here we've taken him um, for nine years and we've changed him into a beautiful butterfly look you know like giving him a suit and shoes and a haircut um and so photography's role in really sort of sharing this group communicating this um is something to think about um you know in that classic natural geographic images and interesting these images are in picasso's archives um and then you know like um especially you know, if we think about, you know, the Pacific and Goga and all these people coming and representing Pacifica people and how they've done that. So I wanted to show you those images so we could come and think about the work of these artists and what they're responding to. And either are they, are they disrupting previous representations? Are they creating new representations? Or, you know, I, I want you to sort of think about um, how how are they responding to this history um, of the ethnographic um, and you know like and are they doing this in a way that is empowering um, in terms of self-representation um, or, or you know sort of what tone and, and visually sort of think about how to anal analyze these images um, in part two we'll be doing that